Ta-da! Welcome to a Care Collab. Today I am teaming up with Todd's Tropicals and Chlorophyll is the new black and we're going to be talking through our Lelia Lundi eyes. So if this is an orchid that is of interest to you and you are wondering about how to take care of it, I'm here in southern Spain, very, very far away from where she normally comes from, Brazil and Bolivia. And if it's an orchid that you have and it might not be growing very well for you, I hope that this care collab with the additional videos that are in the link in the description below will be of help so that your Lelia Lundii can progress and grow and give you as much joy as she's giving me. And the third option would be if you don't have it and if you are wondering if you could take care of it, then I hope that these videos will help you to make a decision with regards to maybe getting it and how you can grow it in your climate. So thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your time. Let's get right into it. First of all, this little Lelia comes with a lot, a lot of names. You can find her under Lelia Regnellii, Lelia Reichenbachiana, Catlia Lundii, Sophronides Lundii, Pletia Lundii, and Microlalia Lundii. And if the genus Microlalia is new to you, well, that is probably because this is the only orchid that falls under the specific genus of Microlalia. Because all things considered, she's pretty, pretty compact and small. The longest growth, if it climbs up on a rhizome, will be about 20 centimeters. So unless the experts find another microlalia that they can classify and put into the genus, this Lundii is the only one. She is also the only one that is a bifoliate lalia found in Brazil. Considering all these little details, she's got quite a lot going for her. And that makes her very, very special in my books. And I'm very glad that I can grow her here in southern Spain without any, any major headaches. And I say that because my setup is lacquer and self-watering. And normally a rambling Lelia like this would prefer to be mounted. She's an epiphyte or lithophyte. And in her natural habitat as a lithophyte, she would be growing on granite outcrops. So it's not a given that lacquer and self-watering would work for this one. And her growth habit can become cumbersome trying to grow her in a pot. But she had absolutely no problem settling in to this setup. It's like she arrived in my collection. This is what I did with her and the rest is history and she's growing really, really well. Based on her altitude and her natural habitat of 740 meters up to 1000 meters, she's considered a warm grower. Now, my temperatures here can range from 5 degrees Celsius all the way up to 40 degrees Celsius during the hottest months of the year. But I do not expose her to the low temperatures, so her location throughout the year is always somewhat protected. In the winter, she is indoors, where the lowest temperatures will be around 17 degrees. And in the summer, she is outdoors, where she is protected from the harshest elements that my climate provides. And when I say harsh, I don't have humidity. And as an epiphyte lithophyte, humidity is quite important. And if it's not the humidity, abundant rainfall would be important. So my compensation here was my setup. And that is possibly why she's doing so well, because she has enough ambient humidity around the pot and the roots are appreciating it because they went straight into the pot. You can see by her growth habit how she is starting to go up and up and then aerial roots will appear. Now, if she was mounted, this would be ideal. They would attach and they would continue growing. So eventually my setup was going to be rather limited in its progress. But when I do up pot her, I will just put her into a bowl kind of setup and see if that will work. If you were to have this orchid mounted, I would say it would need a lot, a lot of water in its growing season. Not so much during the cooler months of the year. She doesn't necessarily have a winter rest as such, but it's just a matter of watering her when required. If you see that the pseudobulbs are starting to wrinkle a little bit, then it was a good time to start watering. In my setup, I flushed her a lot in the early days in order to counteract the very, very shallow roots at the beginning stages. But now she's well rooted in that the flushing in my case happens once a week, no matter the time of year. In the summer, I missed her often. But that is because, as you can see, I've got a lot of airflow and as mentioned, very low humidity. And you can also see that new roots will fail if they don't get enough ambient humidity. So in the summer, I do miss her a lot. But that is also the time of year where her new growths aren't actually active. So in this time of year, she's growing her new growths. There is no misting. 
The temperatures are cooler. The flushing does the work with regards to ambient humidity. By the time the summer comes around, these new growths will have matured a lot more and then misting is not as dangerous. You can see here, I lost a new growth on this little corner right here because I did mist in the early stages and then I remembered this is a big mistake and then I lost the growth. My fertilizer is around 160 parts per million when she is in active growth, which is now. And if I didn't mention it before, her active growth started about two months ago when the eyes started to swell. And then the beauty of this orchid is <laughs> she blooms when the growths are not mature. I always like orchids that do that. We don't have to wait for the growth to mature in order to get blooms. So this growth habit of this orchid, I love it because, you know, the blooms really, really stand out. And the blooms, they will last approximately three to five weeks. A couple of weeks ago, I did a bloom dedication with the first two blooms that had opened that were right here. These two had opened first and they're still beautiful, gorgeous. There's absolutely no sign of them going over. Meanwhile, three more blooms are opening and I have another bud to go right here and hopefully, oh, and here, and hopefully these other growths will also provide me with some blooms. So the longevity of the blooms, the fact that the new growths that are yet to come will also still produce some blooms. This orchid can be in bloom for at least two months, if not more. I don't have a fragrance this year, so I'm not sure why that is. I remember last year she had a fragrance. It was very sweet, very floral, but you had to stick your nose in it to appreciate it. But this year I'm not getting a fragrance. It is possible that that has to do with the amount of light that she is not getting at this point in time because we've had some very, very gloomy, overcast days that didn't shine any light into the grow space where she's currently living. But it is a very sweet, delicate fragrance just when you stick your nose into the bloom. Speaking of light, in the winter, she gets as much light as I possibly can give her, even though she's living indoors. But the winter sun isn't as harsh. So the temperatures being a bit lower, the angle of the sun being a bit lower, she can have about three to four hours of direct sun during the winter time. In the summer, I don't do that. I have her protected under a very, very bright covered portico. Everything reflects white. So she's in a super bright shade in the summers. When it came to pests, when I got this orchid, I had scale issues. That's the only thing I've ever seen on this orchid was scale. I haven't had any mealybugs or anything like that. The scale was quickly dealt with. I had to do subsequent treatments of my garlic alcohol. And since I used the garlic alcohol, I have not had a return of scale and I have actually not administered any of it for over a year now. And she has been clean and free of scale. Now that she's in active growth, the fertilizer is going in, the flushing is on a weekly basis, but definitely no misting at all. She is classified as a Rapiculus lalia, but she differs so, so much from the other structures of a Rapiculus lalia I have in my collection. She is definitely unique in her own right, but super, super sweet. I hope that the footage that I have taken shows the chrysaline effect in the petals and the sepals. And I hope that this video was helpful, either if you're struggling with your Lelia Lundii, or if you're successfully growing your Lelia Lundii, or if you think, yeah, I want one of those in my collection, but I wasn't sure how to deal with her. Well, in my case, self-watering has proven super, super effective. Speaking of if you have a Lele Lundii and you make videos and post them to social media, and if you're interested in joining in on future videos about Lele Lundii, please let me know in the comments. We will get in touch so that in future videos, we get to include you and your Lele Lundii and how you grow yours. If you're having difficulty with your Lele Lundii, then also ask away in the comments. I'll be more than happy to do a deep dive to get your orchid to grow as beautifully as mine. Yes, I'm very proud of my little Lelia Lundia. It is nice to be able to do care collabs where the orchid is in bloom and she's growing well. <laughs> so I really hope that this video was helpful. Thank you so very much for watching my video. I think that pretty much covers everything that I do with my Lelia. Should I have missed out on something or wasn't specific about something, comments are there for a reason. In the meantime, I really appreciate the fact you chose to watch my video and I want to wish you a beautiful day on one condition that you stay safe.
Take care. Bye.